Hey, we are in the last of Judges. Uh, there's only three chapters left. All three deal with the same story. It's Judges uh, is chapter 19, 20, and 21. And I got to tell you, this is one of uh, the craziest, uh, saddest, um, not really sure why it's happening, uh, stories that we'll find not just in um, the Old Testament or in the Bible. I mean, anywhere in the world, historically, this is a this is a sad uh, situation, a sad day, uh, and you wonder why it has to take place. Uh, but it just goes to show you. Uh, when people's hearts turn away from God, um, bad things happen, and there's no rationale behind it. So let's go ahead and start reading. Uh, we'll read through it all, 19 through all the way through 21, uh, and then we'll just do a little running commentary after after that's over, uh, maybe to try to make some sense of what has taken place. Uh, so chapter... 19. In those days, Israel had no king. That's important, no king. Now, a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem in Judah. After she had been there four months, her husband went to her and persuaded her to return. He had with him his servant and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed on him to stay. So he remained with him for three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. On the fourth day, they got up early, and he prepared to leave. But the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh yourself with something to eat. You, then you can go. And so the two men of the two of them sat down to eat and drinks together. Afterward, the woman's father said, please stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him. So he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the woman's father said, refresh yourself, wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father-in-law, the woman's father said, now look, it's almost evening. Spend the night here. The day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning, you can get up and be on your way home. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went toward Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they were near Jebus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, come, let's stop at this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, no, we won't go into any city whose people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah. He added, come, let's try to reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on and the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gibeah, the inhabitants of the place where were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, and the old man asked, where are you going? Where did you come from? And he answered, we are on our way from Bethlehem in Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim where I live. I have been to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I am going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants, me, the woman, and the young man with us. We don't need anything. Well, you are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took, them, it took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house. Pounding on the door, they shouted to the old man who owned the house, Bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. 
Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do what to them whatever you wish. But as for this man, don't do such an outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night, and at dawn they let her go. At daybreak, the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door, and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there's no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them into all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came up out of Egypt. Just imagine, we must do something. So speak up. Then all of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and from the land of Gilead, came together as one and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of God's people. 400,000 men armed with swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, tell us how this awful thing happened. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman, said, I and my concubine came to Gibeah in Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. They raped my concubine, and she died. I took my concubine, cut her into pieces, and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in Israel. Now all of you, is, all you Israelites, speak up and tell me what you have decided to do. All the men rose up together as one, saying, none of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now this is what we'll do to Gibeah. We'll go up against it in the order decided by casting lots. We'll take 10 men out of every hundred from all the tribes of Israel and a hundred from a thousand and a thousand from 10,000 to get provisions for the army. Then when the army arrives at Gibeah in Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for this outrageous act done in Israel. So all the Israelites got together and united as one against this city. The tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, what about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now turn those wicked men of Gibeah over to us so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns, they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once, the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their towns, in addition to seven hundred able young men from whose living those living in Gibeah. Among all these soldiers, there were 700 select troops who were left-handed, each of whom could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fit for battle. The Israelites went up to Bethel, and inquired of God, and they said, Who of us is to go up first to fight against the Benjamites? And the Lord replied, Judah shall go first. The next morning, the Israelites got up and pitched camp near Gibeah, and the Israelites went out to fight the Benjamites and took up battle positions against them at Gibeah. The Benjamites came out of Gibeah and cut down 22,000 Israelites on the battlefield that day. But the Israelites encouraged one another and again took up their positions where they had stationed themselves the first day. The Israelites went up and wept before the Lord until evening, and they inquired of the Lord, and they said, Shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites? And the Lord answered, Go up against them. Then the Israelites drew near to Benjamin that second day. This time, when the Benjamites came out of, from Gibeah to oppose them, they cut down another 18,000 Israelites, all of them armed with swords. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel. And there they sat weeping before the Lord, and they fasted that day until the evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. 
They asked, shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites, or not? And the Lord responded, go, for tomorrow I give them into your hands. Then Israel set an ambush around Gibeah. They went up against the Benjamites on the third day and took up positions against Gibeah as they had done before. The Benjamites came out to meet them and were drawn away from the city, and they began to inflict casualties on the Israelites as before, so that about 30 men fell in the open field on, and on the roads, the one leading to Bethel and the other to Gibeah. While the Benjamites were saying, we are defeating them as, we, as before, the Israelites were saying, let's retreat and draw them away from the city to the roads. All the men of Israel moved from their places and took up positions at Baal Tamar, and the Israelites' ambush charged out of its place on the west of Gibeah. 10,000 of Israel's able young men made a frontal attack on Gibeah. The fighting was so heavy that the Benjamites did not realize how near disaster was. The Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel, and on that day, the Israelites struck down 25,100 Benjamites, all armed with swords. Then the Benjamites saw that they were beaten. Now the men of Israel had given way before Benjamin because they relied on the ambush they had set near Gibeah. Those who had been in the ambush made a sudden dash into Gibeah, spread out and put the whole city to the sword. The Israelites had arranged with the ambush that they should send up a great cloud of smoke from the city and the Israelites would counterattack. The Benjamites had begun to conflict casualties on the Israelites, about 30, and they said, we are defeating them as the first battle. But the, when the column of smoke began to rise from the city, the Benjamites turned and saw the whole city going up in smoke. Then the Israelites counterattacked, and the Benjamites were, were terrified because they realized that disaster had come on them. So they fled before the Israelites in the direction of the wilderness, but they could not escape the battle. And the Israelites who came out of the towns cut them down there. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and easily overran them in the vicinity of Gibeah on the east. 18,000 Benjamites fell, all of them valiant fighters. As they turned and fled toward the wilderness to the Rock of Rimmon, the Israelites cut down 5,000 men along the roads. They kept pressing after the Benjamites as far as Ginnom and struck down 2,000 more. On that day, 25,000 Benjamite swordsmen fell. All of them valiant fighters. But 600 of them turned and fled into the wilderness, the Rock of Rimmon, where they stayed four months. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All the towns they came across, they set on fire. The men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah. Not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. The people went to Bethel, where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and whipping, weeping, weeping bitterly. Lord, God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Early the next day, the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Israelites asked, who from all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they had taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah was to be put to death. Now the Israelites grieved for the tribe of Benjamin, their fellow Israelites. Today one tribe is cut off from Israel, they said. How can we provide wives for those who are left since we have taken an oath by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? Then they asked, which one of the tribes of Israel failed to assemble before the Lord at Mizpah? And they discovered that no one from Jabesh Gilead had come to the camp to the assembly. For when they counted the people, they found that none of the people of Jabesh Gilead were there. So the assembly sent 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to Jabesh Gilead and put to the sword those living there, including the women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man, and they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. Then the whole assembly sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites at the Rock of Rimmon. So the Benjamites returned at that time and were given the women of Jabesh Gilead who had been spared. But there were not enough for all of them. The people grieved for Benjamin because the Lord had made a gap in the tribes of Israel. And the elders of the assembly said, with the women of Benjamin destroyed, how shall we provide wives for the men who are left? The Benjamite survivors has to have, must have heirs, they said so that a tribe of Israel will not be wiped out. 
We can't give them our daughters as wives since we Israelites have taken this oath. Cursed be anyone who gives a wife to a Benjamite. But look, there is the annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh, which lies north of Bethel, east of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem and south to Labona. So they instructed the Benjamites, saying, go and hide in the vineyards and watch. When the young women of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, rush from the vineyards, each of you sees one of them to be your wife. Then return to the land of Benjamin. When your fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, do us a favor of helping them, because we did not give wives for them during the war. You will not be guilty of breaking your oath, because you did not give your daughters to them. So that is what the Benjamites did. While the young women were dancing, each man caught one and carried her off to be his wife. Then they returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and settled in them. At that time, the Israelites left that place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to their own inheritance. For in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now, this is just a tragic story. I mean, there's just words do not express the craziness of what has taken place. We finished the book of Judges. These are the judges of Israel that we have read about that I've mentioned. Samson and Deborah and Ehud. These are the big ones. Gideon we talked about up here going into Manasseh and all that. The down here is where. This story was taking place with the tribe of Benjamin is this light colored area. And because of this story, the Benjamites were about to be wiped out. There's several things that are happening here that we just don't understand. Um, the, the Levite and the concubine, you already have issues there. Um, but the Israelites react. Remember, the law of Moses says there must be at least two accusers. Um, and they take this Levite's word about what has taken place with the Benjamites. Um, and they go to war and they're willing to wipe out a whole clan uh, because of this one incident, incident that takes place. Now, and Two passages talks about Israel not having a king, and the reason they don't have a king is because the God is supposed to be their king, but um, they're not doing what God says anyway. And so it's just a really sad situation, but here's what we find. As we get a little bit farther, guess where the first king of Israel comes from? When finally God relents and allows them to have a king, guess where he comes from? He comes from the tribe of Benjamin that was almost completely wiped out. Only 600 men left. And then they turned around and stole women from, from a party to be able to start their tribe again. It is a crazy situation. It just goes to show that when you start doing things your own way and not doing what God says, how horrible life can really be. Have a great day.